Okay. Sorry about, I apologize for that delay. I got mixed up on a couple things, and anyway, we got it. Uh, we usually, in a, in a case like this, Pastor Steve, we will usually uh, go like this. Make the sign of the cross and say you are forgiven. You have to do um, 33 Hail Marys and uh, 666 Our Fathers. I should make a joke like that, but uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you, Pastor Steve. Listen, we are, we are here uh, as a result of, of your graceful largesse. You're allowing us to piggyback on your Zoom and to borrow you and your time. Uh, I, I'm going to sing your praises again because, uh, listen, I have reached out to a lot of prominent figures and, and more than a few, more than a few are Adventist um, teachers. Uh, there's one teacher that I they absolutely adore, calls me his family and doesn't respond to me. I don't understand why, but um, I'm very excited to have you back, very excited to have your time. And as I, as I teased my audience in our first interview, not only are you uh, an old friend of the show and of mine, but uh, I think you've got something on your new take with, not your new take, but your, your new book and your, uh, your breakdown of Revelation, particularly Revelation 17. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited to get into the, the weeds on that. Let me start off with uh, something that I combat a lot as I go through uh, Christian so-called alternative media, there are uh, a large number, and I don't know how many of these you are aware of, a large number of hosts in alternative media, quote-unquote, and they, and they are self-avowed Christians and yet the words Jesuit, Vatican, Catholic are nowhere on their horizon. They talk about it. You're streaming that you're doing. You have a co-host. Is his name Tim? Give me his name again. Yes, Tim Saxton. Tim. Okay. He's doing, he's doing a great job. You're both are doing a great job. And, and Tim mentioned, you know, there are a lot of books. There's, a Tim, there's the whole Tim LaHaye uh, series that were made into movies with Nicolas Cage. Are you kidding me? How do they have mm -hmm. that clout? Uh, cl clearly, you're getting help from uh, a Luciferian source, a and, and Brother Tim pointed this out. There are a lot of Christians out there writing books and giving speeches um, and basically promoting the Jesuit understanding of eschatology and end times. We have no idea who the Antichrist is. He's just going to pop up out of nowhere sometime in the, in the future. He's, gonna, he's going to, oh my goodness, I can keep you a whole, whole other two or three more just thinking about Israel. Uh, and, and you are one of my top citations on prophetic Israel. Does, does, does Israel exist? Can you give a quick summary of what Israel should mean to Christians today? A quick summary of what no, Israel there's no, should you mean. You can't quick summarize today. it. I know you can. I'm sorry. Well, do the I'll, best of your ability. I'll do my best. Boy, I mean, you just, you just shifted quickly I from did. the Jesuits to. to Israel. Boom. Uh, Israel, that was a, a fast one. I know. So, I know. Uh, okay. Uh, since since you asked, I will I will give you. And I have another book I don't have in front of me here, but I do have a book that I've written called uh, Israel, Babylon, and Armageddon, which is a study of that topic. And in a nutshell, uh, what I see in the New Testament is clearly the concept, the truth of what I call two Israels, just like we have two eyes, we have two ears. Uh, there are two Israels in the New Testament. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18, Paul wrote, Behold Israel after the flesh. Uh, Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter uh, 9, verse 3 and 4. He talks about uh, those who are Israelites according to the flesh. And Israel, Israelites according to the flesh are uh, Israelites who can trace their lineage back to Abraham, their bloodline, but they're, they're of the flesh, which means that they're not of God. Uh, they don't really know God. They don't know Jesus. And in uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, Paul talks about the Israel of God. 
And those are his words, the Israel of God. And when you read the book of Galatians very carefully, it's very clear that uh, the Israel of God is composed of Jewish believers in Jesus and Gentile believers in Jesus who become one in Christ. Uh, he said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, he said, you are all one in Christ Jesus. So my view is that there's an Israel of God, which is a composite Israel of Jewish believers like Peter and John and James and uh, Barnabas and Silas and, you know, the, uh, Paul, who helped uh, advance the early Christian church. And then there's the Israel of the flesh, which is composed of uh, Jewish people that don't believe in Jesus, that have rejected Jesus, such as Annas, Caiaphas, uh, you know, and the Sanhedrin and the rulers and the group that made Paul's life so miserable as he was a missionary to Thessalonica, to Philippi, to Corinth, to all these different cities that churches were planted in. There was a segment of Jewish people that were so hostile to his ministry uh, that, you know, he, it's amazing he lived as long as he did. So two Israels, Israel of the flesh and Israel of God. Now the question is when it comes to the book of Revelation and end time events, uh, which Israel is the center of the storm? Which Israel is the focus of God's prophecies in the end times? And I'm convinced that it is the Israel of God in Jesus Christ, composed of Jewish believers and Gentile believers who are united in, in Christ. Uh, these are, this is the focus of Revelation. Uh, their home is the New Jerusalem. They come out of spiritual Babylon, just like the Israelites did in the Old Testament. They came out of literal Babylon. So God has his spiritual Israelites who come out of spiritual Babylon, which has uh, includes the Catholic Church uh, dominantly, the mother and the daughters in these last days. And so that's what my book is about. It, it builds a case that the focus of prophecy is not a rebuilt Jewish temple over in Israel. It is not Israel after the flesh. Uh, it's the Israel of God that are centered in Jesus Christ. Amen, Pastor. Well done. Thank you. I'm sorry I threw you that curveball, but uh, I, did it, I did it because your teaching is so good on, on Israel, on prophetic Israel. Uh, modern Christianity is, as far as I'm concerned, very misled and misguided by a, a Jesuit bent of a focus on Jerusalem. And that is a distraction. Because if we're not looking at Jerusalem, we're looking at Rome. And, and one of our key figures that we talk about uh, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, and the 12,060 days of prophecy of Daniel 7, is Napoleon Bonaparte. And Napoleon Bonaparte almost recreated Israel ahead of time. I think it was 1799 he intended on recreating Israel and wasn't able to do it because the, strategically he did not have the ability to do it, but it was on his, it was on his agenda. So my point is there are very, very many conservative Christians who are greatly misled on this idea of Israel and so-called Zionism. Zionism, I would, I would define Zionism as the well-being of the political nation-state of Israel, of modern Israel. It is a complete fabrication based on the, the Freemasonic Jesuits creation. Rothschilds has absolutely nothing to do uh, prophetically, significantly, es eschatologically for Christians. Do you have something you're yeah, I do. I just want to share a text that uh, what you're saying brings to mind a couple of texts. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but in Revelation 17, verse 1, uh, the, there came one of the seven angels who had the seven vials, and he talked with me, and he said, Come here, I will show to you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. And, of course, that's talking about mystery Babylon. But notice the way the angel said, it's one of the seven angels. He said, Come here, I'm going to show you this woman. Now, if you look at chapter uh, 21, this is very interesting. Chapter 21, verse 9 there came to me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, which 
you know, perfectly parallels what we just read in chapter 17, uh, full of the seven last plagues. And he talked with me and he said, come here. Same thing we just read in chapter 17. And then he says, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit, which is what happened in Revelation 17. John was carried away in the spirit. So here he's carried away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So chapter 17, verse 1, and chapter 21, verse 9 and 10, perfectly parallel. Was probably the same angel. He used the same words. He said, come here. I'm going to show you. In one case, he showed uh, John the whore. And in the other case, he showed him the bride, the lamb's wife, which is the new Jerusalem. And these parallel passages uh, teach us a lesson that the two big contenders in the book of Revelation are Babylon and the new Jerusalem and those who ultimately will inhabit the new Jerusalem, which are God's people. Those are the contenders. It's not uh, Israel after the flesh against Russia or China or Iran or Hezbollah. It is a Babylon versus the new Jerusalem. Uh, and to me, that's just critical so we understand who the real contestants are and we're not being led on, on rabbit trails trying to, you know, going in the wrong direction. Amen. Amen. Home run, Pastor. This is, this is why I love you and your, and your ministry, uh, even though I'm not an Adventist. Fantastic work. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, chapter 17, verse 2 says that those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Uh, Pastor, what would you say wine is in this sense? Yes, in this passage, wine refers to teachings, uh, the, the false teachings of uh, Mystery Babylon. Jesus said uh, in, in one of the Gospels, he was talking to the Pharisees, and he said, uh, new wine must be put in new wineskins. And he was referring to his teaching, it must be put in new people in order for it to really, you know, sink in. And, but, and then he said, uh, he talked about the old wine and the old wineskins, which was the Pharisaic teaching. And he said, if you take my new wine and put it in the old wineskins, it's gonna, it, they're going to break. So you can't mix the pure teachings of Christ with the teachings of the Pharisees. They just don't mix. You need uh, new wine to go in new wineskins. So wine refers to teachings. And when it says here that the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. This is the wine of Babylon, the teachings of Babylon that uh, come out of her union with the kings of the earth. Her fornication with these kings results in, in false teachings. And that's the history of the Roman church is she's, uh, she, she left Jesus as the bridegroom and uh, courted the lover, her lovers, which were the kings, and compromised with pagan teachings, and then uh, pressured the kings to enforce uh, the doctrine that the Roman Catholic Church is the only true church, and everybody else is a heretic and deserves to die. And all of that, those doctrines that came out of this union with the uh, kings of the earth, is the wine of Babylon, which deceives Amen. people. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close our impromptu surprise section on Israel with this. I've run into too many Christians who are misguided on this. Would you, Pastor, say that there are any promises to anyone who is Jewish without the saving faith in Jesus Christ? Well, th there are promises in the Bible uh, to the Israelite people. There's no question about that. But those promises, Paul is clear in the New Testament that they apply to those who believe in Jesus. Uh, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So if you go back to Genesis, God made promises to Abraham and his seed. And he did this throughout the Old Testament. But then Paul gives a little twist there. He says, uh, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And he does not say seeds as of many, but as of one seed. And then Paul says, and that seed is Christ. It's Jesus Christ. He is the primary seed of Abraham. 
And so the promises of God to Abraham and his seed ultimately are to Jesus Christ and those who are in Christ. And then Paul says to the Gentiles who are reading his book, he said, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and you are an heir according to the promise. So the promises apply to Christ and those who are in Christ. That's what Paul said uh, in Galatians 3.16. And, you know, with that kind of theology, you can understand why uh, some Jewish people that didn't, didn't believe that, you know, they were very, very hostile to him. And they, you know, they hunted him. He would go from, from place to place. And sometimes they would leave one city. The unbelieving Jews would leave one city and follow him into another city and raise a ruckus. And they tried to kill him. And at one point, there were 40, uh, 40 of them uh, that had made a covenant that they would not eat or drink until they killed Paul. And so the hostility of, of the unbelieving Jewish people to Paul was, uh, was intense. And I think one of the reason is, is because Paul had a different theology than they did. Paul was Christ-centered, and his theology was that he needed to reach out to the Gentiles and help the Gentiles to become part of the Israel of God. And those who were prejudiced against the Gentiles, they, they couldn't handle that, that theology. And, and but Paul... it's right there in the Bible. Paul, Peter, and John, not to cut you off, but Paul, Peter, and John, all of them, um, were whenever they witnessed to Jews, they said, this is the Christ whom you had executed. So this too, they, they, uh, they gnashed their teeth at that. And uh, boy, one time they, they even broke Roman law and tried to murder him with stones and thought they had killed him and left him for dead, but he had survived. So that's right. I just read that. I've been reading the book of Acts in my devotionals, and I've been very impressed with the reality of the Israel of God and the unbelieving Jews that were, you know, they were, they were uh, persecutors, heavy persecutors of the early Christians. Well, I'm excited to be part of that coincidence that you just happened to be reading that, Pastor. You know, I want to, uh, again, close this section out with uh, something else that I like, to, I like to bring up whenever I'm talking about uh, Christian Zionism and the promotion of the political state of Israel. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me, in other words, he who lives with Jesus Christ, makes Jesus Christ an intimate part of their life. I, in him, he bears much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing and you are nothing. So uh, again, I would remind my misguided Jesuit instructed Christian brethren, Protestant evangelical Christian brethren, that you are just that. You are misguided on the modern nation state of Israel. There is no zero prophetic significance for, as Pastor says, the Israel of the flesh. So let me jump in. Uh, and jo Johnny, wait, jo hold on, Johnny. Before you jump to, let me just say one more thing about sure. what you just said. Sure. Uh, I think it's, it's extremely important, and this is going to tie in some of the bigger dots that we've been discussing. Uh, I, I've become increasingly convicted. Uh, I've been on all kinds of shows, you know, like this one with you just discussing these things. I've been on radio shows. I've been on the Cornerstone Television Network. I was on Fox News Radio with a big host. And I've gotten, the Lord has opened up doors for me to get on all kinds of conservative uh, yeah. talk radio programs to discuss different aspects of Bible prophecy. Yeah. And uh, most of the time when I'm on with these sh shows, like for instance, when I'm talking about Approaching Armageddon, which is another one of my books that deals with the end times. I don't have a, yes, I do. I do have a copy of this. Approaching Armageddon deals with the signs of the times and what's happening in the world and how we're getting closer to the final battle. And I would say 80% of the time when I'm on with these different hosts talking about this topic, uh, they bring up Israel. They say, well, what about Israel? How does Israel tie into all this? And the reason why they say that is because their, their eschatology is very Israel-centered. And as I've gone through this journey, I've concluded that the focus on Israel is a, is a massive uh, diversion so that people do not see the significance of the Vatican and America. So it's not just a theology that's wrong, but it's a re it's a replacement. You know, people talk about replacement theology, and this is my version of replacement theology that Israel has replaced the Vatican and America in, in the uh, focus 
of so many Christians, and I think it's a, a huge, a huge mistake. Pastor, uh, I'm giving you a, a suffocating virtual coronavirus hug right now. Another <laughs> fantastic home run. Uh, we, we have, we teach the proper eschatology, and we are slandered for replacement theology. It is actually their Jesuit replacement theology that is a distraction, exactly what you said. There's, there's nothing to add to that. It, it is replacement of the true eschatology, the true prophetic significance of Revelation and, and Daniel, I'm backing that up. Uh, something else that, that I find that I am challenged with uh, in my field, uh, you may not come across this as much as I do, but people who call themselves uh, Christian hosts revel in uh, this concept of genetic tampering with uh, angels and intermarrying and, and they reference Genesis chapter 6 verse 1. Uh, I noticed that one, a lot of other pastors will just avoid it entirely. Unfortunately, I think there's a balance to this topic. I think there's there is some minor significance to it, but it is taken to a ridiculous extreme as another extra, a distraction. That there, there, there does seem to me anyway, be evidence for some sort of genetic tampering, although obviously angels are, are radically different from human beings, and it's a whole other argument as to whether or not it is possible. However, I, I'm concerned as far as Daniel 2 and the understanding of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and his human-like statue uh, made of four metals that we, that we interpret as uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And that final, that final uh, section, beast, that final area of the legs, it starts off as iron, and then it ends up as um, iron mixed with miry clay in the feet and toes. And then, let's see, I don't have to pull it up. Uh, chapter 2, verse 43. Uh, and you saw the iron mixed with common clay. I'm, forgive me, I'm reading. I know a lot of my flying monkeys hate it when I, I, I vary from the King James. Um, iron mixed with common clay. They will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another. I personally, I, I know you don't subscribe to this, Pastor, but I personally see this. You have these, these four previous empires. They're all metal. Uh, now you have the beginnings of the uh, Catholic and Orthodox empire, the two legs of iron. And then you have this, this new material introduced. And then you specifically have what appears to me to be a contrast. The... Um, the iron mixed with clay is a contrast mingling with the seed of men. What that to me that implies something that aren't men. So I, I know you prefer to um, see this as uh, say Europeans intermarrying. I don't know. I, I think there's a possibility for some kind of understanding. For me personally, I think it's possible that we're in the end times, and the adversary is pulling out all the stops. If it's possible for the adversary and his minions to personally experience what's going on by somehow um, entering into the bodies of men through whatever weird, perverse process that they can, uh, I think that they would absolutely do that. And, you know, I have another example of why I think this is possible. Jude verses 6 and 7. Where are my... I'm scanning through my notes. Where are we here? I've got to read it off my phone because I'm not allowed to get... Here we are. Jude 6 and 7. Jude, of course, my flying monkeys, is only one chapter. So when anybody mentions Jude, they only mention it by verses. Starting at verse 6. What did I grab? I think I grabbed New King James. Uh, and, the angels who did not, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under the darkness of judgment for the great day. And then the connection to that, same sentence, different verse, is related to extreme sexual depravity and sin as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner, having given themselves to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. So there's really nothing to say about this unless it's something pops up. As I just want to plant a seed, pardon my pun here, as to the possibility of 
the adversary is so interested and involved in this that he's pulling out all the stops. And I think there might be an empowering to the Jesuit-run Vatican with uh, either, either possession. There's, if you don't want to talk about that, whether or not angels can intermarry, how about this? Um, I've had a lot of questions from my audience. Do you think that, say, either the superior general or the popes, do you think that in order to attain their position, they have to become demon-possessed and are beyond salvation? Uh, say that last part again. What's the the last so part? The question, to, I think the question the, is uh, okay. So our understanding is that Rome is the fourth and final beast, the beast unlike any other, and it is a very very evil entity. She is the harlot, drunk in the blood of the saints. To attain positions like superior general within the Jesuits, to attain the position of the white pope, the top Catholic authority, do you think that there is a process that includes demon possession? and the individual that becomes either superior general or the, the pope, do you think that they're demon-possessed and possibly beyond salvation? Uh, I, I definitely think that many of them are demon-possessed. Uh, personally, I don't think that Satan needs to genetically link with a person in order to possess them. I mean, we know, obviously, from the New Testament, the man whose name was Legion, there were many. Satan can come in with his demons. Uh, Judas was possessed. It says Satan entered Judas. And so, uh, you know, he can get right into the mind and he can experience whatever he wants to experience by being, you know, just uh, dwelling inside of a person. I think that a lot of the people within the Roman Catholic Church, especially higher up, they are definitely uh, led by Satan, whether they are, and I think many of them are most likely possessed by Satan. Do I think that they are beyond the reach of God? Uh, some of them probably are by their own choice. They've gone too far. But, you know, we know in Revelation 18, verse 4, it says, come out of her, my people, so that God has people in there, in the Roman church. There's a lot of people that are his people that the Holy Spirit is still working with. Uh, I think about Saul in, in chapter 9 of the book of Acts. It says he was breathing out hatred and, and hostility and, you know, against the disciples of the Lord. And he was just totally committed uh, to to hunting down the Christians and destroying them. And yet the Lord uh, arrested him on the road to Damascus. And, and I was, I've been impressed with how gracious Jesus was to Saul when he knocked him down right before he got into Damascus to kill the Christians or to round them up and bring them back to Jerusalem. Uh, he shone a light around him and he said, the voice said, Saul, Saul, uh, why are you persecuting me? And, and then he was so, so shocked and he looked up and he said, you know, who, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. Uh, I'm the one that you're persecuting. And then he said, Jesus said, it's hard for you to kick against the, the pricks, meaning it's hard for you to go against your conscience, isn't it, Saul? Because Saul had seen Stephen's face shining like an angel before he got stoned, and the Holy Spirit was wrestling with him, and he was resisting that. So Jesus was just so, he was so gracious to his, his uh, persecutor, you know, killing his children. He said, isn't it hard for you to go against your conscience? And then he was so, uh, Saul was so overwhelmed not only by the light and the truth but by the graciousness of, of Christ that he became his devoted loyal follower for the rest of his life had his head cut off uh, wrote more books in the New Testament than any other writer uh, was instrumental like no one else to raise up churches and that was uh, Saul the persecutor and so that tells me you know that's that somebody who who seems like they're they're they've gone too far you know god is uh his grace is amazing and so well he had I, an ulterior motive pastor he had an ulterior motive he he can see the beginning from the end and he knew that once he struck paul down and showed paul the light he would be the most prolific of all the apostles yeah but it was a good ulterior motive Absolutely. it was a uh, 
That's right. It was an unselfish motivation, and, it was. and God is good. It, and it, so, so as as far as popes go, you know, I, 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 I don't want to say that uh, because a person is a pope or a cardinal or even a Jesuit, that they are automatically uh, irre irredeemably uh, excluded from the kingdom of God. Uh, I've heard stories, you know, we know about the Jesuits and their infiltrating Protestant, Protestant churches, and I've heard recently about, I, I know that, you know, Jesuits have, in the history of the Adventist church, have tried to come in. I wouldn't doubt that they're trying to do it now. And I've heard that uh, a number of them have become Adventists because they, you know, they try to infiltrate the church and they, they've got their strategy, but they, they're exposed to the truth of the Bible and the Holy Spirit pulls on their hearts and many of them have decided I'm I'm going to give up my uh, my Jesuit ways and I'm going to become a true follower of Jesus and start keeping the Sabbath and and wait for the second coming and so the, you know God's grace is amazing and I think that's where uh, you know it's not up to us to make those decisions to take someone's name out of the book of life let's let the Lord do that and let him judge and work on people as long as time shall last. That is perfectly put, Pastor. Um, re really, that's, that's the end result of that question. I've had that question posed to me, and I would say exactly what you said. There's no need to answer that question. You continue to drive on whatever situation could possibly put you in that position. Would you trust a Jesuit? Would you trust a, lead a leader within the Catholic Church? Uh, whether or not they could receive, whether or not they could sincerely receive Christ, that is possible to any human being, as long as they qualify as a human being. They, any human being who draws breath can accept Christ, and sometimes it's the ones who hate Christ the most that can be turned to become the most powerful Christians. In fact, that, that's, right out of, that's right out of Revelation as, as well, that, that Christ says that um, uh, in um, his message to the seven churches, it's the ones that are lukewarm that he vomits out of his mouth, not the ones that hate him. So, and it's funny you should mention Jesuits as an example, Pastor. I have that in my notes. Uh, I want to throw this at you. You and I have talked offline about the identity of the ten horns. And, and I want to get into some detail of the, the dragon with the seven heads and the ten horns. But as far as this, and, and me focusing on your teaching has forced me to get into the weeds of the details of how it is that the the harlot will be ended. Uh, the ten horns, Revelation 17, verses 12 through 14, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have, and I think I'm, again, forgive me for reading a non-textus receptus translation. I think this is New King James. They receive authority for one hour. That means to me their authority is temporary as kings with the beast, they are of one mind. They will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war with the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Now, for me, the 10 kings without kingdoms, I know you feel that these are European leaders. I am more open to the idea that these are Jesuits, possibly Jesuit provincials, because of phrases like they are of one mind, because of phrases like kings without kingdoms. That, to me, is, uh, speaks of Jesuit provincial power. They rule more assuredly than the prime ministers and presidents of Europe. They are the ones behind the prime ministers and presidents. And I did not really appreciate this until I followed your, got into the weeds with you as you were teaching me in relation to the specific method by which the harlot has her flesh torn and is burned with fire. It's done by the 10 kings. It is the 10 kings that turn on the harlot. And That's right. For, for me, if, if it's possible, these 10 kings are Jesuit provincials, how perfect would that be? How, how poetic and how like? There, there's, a, there's a study on anyone that would kill God's chosen. The method, the instrument by which they would try to kill God's chosen is the very method that they die with. Um, Pharaoh tried to drown Moses and himself was drowned. Um, 
Mordecai was there was a there was a uh, gallows. Let me see if I can get. Uh, is it? Let's see here. Yeah, Haman set up the Haman gallows. Haman set up the gallows, gallows for Mordecai, and he himself and he was hung, hung on, on the that. gallows. Uh, Porce, yeah, and the same thing with the the beast. You know, it says he, he who leads into captivity will go into captivity. He, he who, who kills, kills with, with the, the sword, sword will die must the sword. be killed with the sword. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, Saul tried to kill David by his own hand, and by his own hand he killed himself instead. So there's a lot of examples, and, and, and I'm, I'm tickled by this possibility. To me, it's just a possibility that these are, are maybe these are Jesuit provincials. Uh, and it leads to me, it leads to me in something else I was listening to you and teaching about the bowls in Revelation 16. And in particular, the fifth bowl of darkness and pain. The, angel, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, the throne of the beast and his kingdom. And it became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And they blasphemed God, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and yet they did not repent. Uh, Pastor, do you believe that this is a curse upon Rome? You mean the fifth plague? Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. The fifth plague goes upon the seat of the beast, which is Rome. So the Vatican will be in darkness uh, in the fifth plague, and I believe that is the very thing that opens the eyes of the ten kings that have been supporting and giving their power and strength to the beast when they see the judgments fall and darkness on the Vatican. That is the final straw that opens their eyes and, and convinces them that they've been duped by this power. And so then they turn on her and they tear her to pieces, uh, which is what we read in, in Revelation 17. But let me share a couple thoughts about some of the things you said. Sure. Uh, you, you mentioned Bible translations. You know, this is just a, oh something else to consider. Um, the Bible that I'm reading here is a King James Easy Reader Bible. Okay. Uh, Texas Receptus, King James, but it's a, it's a Bible I, I finally found, and I love this Bible. King James Easy Reader Bible, which is a King James, true King James, but it's been updated with some modern words, and it's, it's the, the new King James has some, some difficulties, as you know. Right. Uh, overall, I think it's good, but it's got problems. But this Bible, for those that are looking for a good King James Bible that's uh, you know, more, a little, bit, little easier to read, Whitehorse Media has these, has these Bibles. Now, as far as the Ten Kings, I've been really studying a lot about this and you know, going over and over and over this in my mind, and... In chapter uh, 16, verse 13, 16, 13, it says, I, John says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, and they came out of the mouth of the dragon. That's, you know, the pagan Rome and the pagan influences of the world, and the beast, which is the Roman Catholic Church, which the dragon gives his power to, and the false prophet, which I apply to the second beast in Revelation 13, apostate Protestantism, and then it says, these spirits go out of the mouths of these powers. And it says in verse 14 there, the spirits of devils working miracles, and they go forth to the kings of the earth uh, and of the whole world. So here's the kings now. And, and this, the ten horns, it says, the ten horns are ten kings, which have no authority as of yet, but they will receive uh, authority uh, for one hour with the beast. Now, it seems to me, Johnny, and we're just in the weeds here, like you, you I use that term. Um, it seems to me that the ten, that the kings of the earth and of the whole world are separate from the beast itself, because the evil spirits go out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, and then they go out to those kings to gather them together to fight against God. So, you know, it's a, it's a difficult topic, these who are these 10 horns. Uh, I do think there's a European applic application, but I also am very open to there being a worldwide application based on Revelation 16, 13, and 14, that the spirits go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world, it says. So we got the kings of the whole world, and in Revelation 17, when it says these 10 uh, horns are 10 kings that finally support the beast, I do see evidence for them having a European application. I also see evidence for them having a whole world application.
this is pointing to all the, the legislative authority of the kings of the earth, the kingdoms of the earth, state power uh, supporting the papacy. And then that uh, support evaporates when the Vatican is in darkness. Uh, I, I'm open to that, Pastor, and I, I certainly can see the significance. I'll tell you, when I look at, uh, from, from my perspective uh, uh, politically, when I look at Europe politically, I just see a, 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 a hodgepodge of despicable, empty puppets who are running and ruining Europe on behalf of the Vatican, destroying Europe, um, and it is, it is these puppets that are, that are such a burden to the poor Christians of Europe. I really don't see them having the strength and will to do anything on their own, not least of which is to turn on their masters, but anything is possible. Uh, something else, I'm going to really test you on your ego and uh, run the risk of, of giving you too many compliments, but I want to give you yet another one. Although we may disagree on exactly what the mark is, I don't know that it's, for me personally, I don't think it's as intimately tied with the Sabbath as you might. Something you have been saying in relation to the mark being placed on the forehead is in relation to the thoughts of those who take the mark and making them willing participants. And I'll tell you again, that is something I have been saying myself. For me personally, the mark of the beast, uh, I, I would consider the forehead and the hand are indicative of the victim having a mind that is one with, with the devil and his uh, Vatican... Um, harlot and the mark being on the right hand for me is indicative of someone who is thinking in a way that pleases Rome and acting the right hand being a metaphor for a person's actions your right hand is doing what your heart your mind tell it to and so again I, I don't know if I'm if I'm uh, mischaracterizing something that you said in relation to the mark on the forehead it's not strictly just a metaphor, but it is, in, I would say, it's indicative of the person taking the mark having a mind in unison with, the, with Rome, with... Oh, yeah, yeah, Johnny, I'm very, that's very close to my position. Uh, what, what I've done in, in many of my books and, and presentations is when you look at Daniel 7 and you compare it to Revelation 13, as you know, they go right together. Both chapters talk about a lion, a bear, a leopard, a dragon like these, ten horns, a little horn with a mouth speaking great things, war on the saints. You know, both chapters deal with these, these, these major truths. And then at the end of Revelation 13, we have a mark going in the forehead and in the hand. And it makes sense to me that if Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 go right together straight down, and at the end of chapter 13 there's a mark in the forehead, and hand, why wouldn't there be something at the end of Daniel 7 that would parallel that? And in Daniel 7.25, it talks about the little horn. It says that uh, he will think, which is in your mind, to change times and laws. And I see that as the parallel, uh, the thinking of the horn to change the law of God. So his thinking to change becomes a mark in chapter uh, 13 of Revelation. And my understanding is that the Roman church has changed the Bible Sabbath into Sunday. It thinks it can change God's law. And at the end of time, that change will be enforced as a mark. And people that believe in that change in their minds, linking with Rome, they get the mark in their foreheads. And I think there'll be some people that that don't believe it, but because of the pressure, they're going to go along with it because they can't buy or sell unless they go along. And they think, well, I, I don't believe this, but, you know, I got to feed my family. So they get the mark in their hand, in their actions. Wow. But ultimately, the issue is is the mind. And when people think like the papal power, you know, they're getting the mark in the in the forehead at the very end, and ultimately that power is a commandment-breaking power. It it's, exalts itself above God and believes, hey, God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger, but we are the true church, and we can change that. 
And to me, that's where the final battle line is drawn between the authority of the king of the universe who wrote his law with his own finger on stone and the authority of the papal power that says we can change that. And ultimately the whole, the gospel is at stake here because the gospel is that Jesus Christ took the sins of breaking the law into his mind and into his heart in Gethsemane and on the cross, and he paid the price for our sins. And so uh, a lot of evangelicals, they, they miss that where they don't understand that the reason for the cross is because we broke the law. You know, sin is breaking the law. And people say, well, you know, Jesus died. But then you say, well, what did he die? Why did he die? And then they say, well, because of sin. And then you say, well, what is sin? And they don't know. But we know from Scripture that sin is breaking God's law. Romans 3.20, 1 John 3.4, Romans 7.7, sin is breaking the commandments. And that's the reason why Jesus died because it's so uh, it's so horrific to to be a commandment breaker against the the laws the good laws the just laws of the king of the universe and that's why he paid the price and his goal is to win our hearts back to loyalty and obedience to him rather than to the the papal beast amen pastor and look uh, not not adventists may disagree with a um, an emphasis on the sabbath but it's absolutely unquestionable that the Roman, the Roman harlot, the Roman beast, has absolutely changed times and laws. The reason why it's so difficult for us to understand prophecy and trace prophecy back historically is because there was an old calendar created by the, a military Roman, Julius Caesar, and it was um, mixed up even further by Jesuit Christopher Clavius into the Gregorian calendar that we all use today. So it's absolutely inarguable that um, it is the Vatican, it is the Jesuit-run Vatican who has changed times and laws, and whether or not uh, non-Adventists w- would, would put emphasis on the, on the, uh, the Sabbath, it's just inarguable that, uh, you know, you can get into uh, gender roles, sexuality. Uh, you know, I, I've said this so many times. If, um, if Pope Francis wanted to end abortion, he could do it in a, in a, in a second. He could do it overnight. Francis could end abortion overnight. Clearly, it is not important to him. And I would say just the opposite, uh, that the Vatican runs off of the blood and tears of children. All of the major, all of the major Catholic, overtly Catholic uh, leaders, people of note, powerful politicians, are hard left, pro-abortion, uh, for the perversion of sexuality and understanding of marriage, and they're all in good standing. I could go through the list from, from the President of the United States to the Speaker of the House. It sickens me to say any of that. Uh, they're all in good standing with their church as, as uh, radical and perverse to the left that, that, that they are. So it's inarguable that she has, that Rome, it is Rome, and Rome has changed times and laws. You know, I, when, I, when I look back at this fifth bowl of darkness and pain, I can't think, help but think, Pastor, um, in a strategic or a military sense, when we're thinking about the ending of the great harlot, something something that Rome undoubtedly has is a control which she has stepped up with the coronavirus from 9-11 through to the coronavirus, the the police state, the eavesdropping, the technology, uh, the closed circuit TV cameras, what are they, like every three meters in London? Absolutely ridiculous. I would say through fear, intelligence gathering is a top priority for the Vatican and all of her proxies, the CIA, the United States government, MI6, the British government, all of, all of the Vatican's proxies live off of stealing information from us because she is desperately afraid of, of us, of those who are in Christ righteous and awake. And for me, it would again be thrilling if this darkness was a sudden, a sudden loss somehow through some quirk of virus or, or um, a rebellion in this intelligence gathering apparatus of the Vatican. I would, I would love for that to be the key, the beginning of the end, is that suddenly she goes dark, not necessarily physically dark, 
but loses her massive intelligence gathering apparatus. Just food for thought, Pastor. I wanted to close with, um, to me, your, your, your magnificent opus and the understanding of the seven heads. There are, first, are there more than one dragon with seven heads and ten horns? How many are there? Yeah, there, I don't remember whether we talked about this in the first a interview. Bit. We did. Uh, we did a little bit. Yeah, let me just kind of recap that in the in the Bible there are only three places where there is a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. The first one, and they're all in the Book of Revelation. Right. Uh, it's it's uniquely Revelation, and the first seven-headed, ten-horned beast is in Revelation chapter twelve which is a dragon, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And Revelation 12, verse 9, identifies that dragon with Satan himself. But if you look at verse 4, 5, and 6, it's very clear that that uh, seven-headed, ten-horned dragon is also connected to history and to the Roman Empire, so connected to history and to the Roman Empire because it was the Roman Empire that stood before the woman to devour the child as soon as it was born. As soon as Jesus was born, uh, Satan worked through Herod to send uh, soldiers to Bethlehem to kill all the children under two years old. And if you look at the history of the early Christian church, it was you know Romans, Romans that nailed Jesus to the cross. It was uh, you know Roman emperors, like Nero and Diocletian and uh, Decius that persecuted the Christians. So I see the, the seven-headed dragon as Satan working through the Roman Empire, uh, the city of seven hills. Pastor, can I highlight that? Can I highlight that? You know, that's exactly what occurs in Revelation 12, 3, which is the first mention of the dragon with seven heads and ten, and ten horns. That dragon also is the one that, su that sweeps away a third of the stars. And to me, that's a metaphor for taking a third of the angels yes, with, with Satan as he falls. And yes, definitely. So, so I would say you've, you've perfectly put it. You've brilliantly put it. So we're talking about, simultaneously, we're talking about Satan and Rome at the same time. So that when Rome acts, Rome is basically the intimate proxy of Satan. That's right. It's and, and, and I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but I, uh, I discovered in my research that the seven-headed, ten-horned uh, dragon in Revelation 12, he has cr crowns, which have to do with rule, and his crowns are on the heads, seven heads, but not on the horns. And then when you get to chapter 13, we have the second seven-headed, ten-horned beast, which is like a leopard, be like a bear. It takes the the elements of Babylon, Persia, and Greece into itself, and then it sits upon the seat of the dragon, which is in Rome, and so that's the papal beast. And that, that beast, that seven-headed, ten-horned beast, so you got pagan Rome shifting to papal Rome, and the crowns are now on the horns, not on the heads, indicating a development that now you've got the papal Rome ruling Europe through the kings of Europe. And then we get to chapter 17, that's the third seven-headed, ten-horned beast, and that's a scarlet beast. And uh, it has seven heads and ten horns, but there's no crowns on the heads or the horns, which to me indicates that now papal Rome is in a wounded uh, state where its political power has been curtailed. But as you keep reading that chapter, eventually that political power comes back. The beast ascends out of the bottomless pit. The ten horns give their legislative power back to the beast, and it is fully revived. It comes out of the bottomless pit and goes into perdition. And that's what's coming. What's coming is the full revival of the papal power and the full restoration of its uh, connection to the kings and civil authority. So that's what I see. Three beasts, each represent different phases of Rome, Pagan Rome, Papal Rome, Papal Rome wounded, and then revived in the final times. And I think that is solid information. I agree, Pastor. I think that's a, that I would say that's a solid understanding of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. Uh, I would also say, let's see, in relation to 
these dragons, you mention phases, phases of the dragons and also phases of the seven heads. Who are the seven heads of this final dragon in Revelation 17? Yeah, well, what they, they, the angel says that the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So I see that as the primary application to the seven-hilled city of Rome. But then the angel throws a, a curveball, and he says, and there are also seven kings. Uh, now, there's, you know, different ways to look at that. Are the seven kings separate from the seven heads, or is it another application of the seven heads uh, I'm leaning in the direction of it being, uh, well, I've looked at this on different sides. Um, well, first of all, let me say kings in the Bible refer to kingdoms. We know that from Daniel 7. So when it says there are seven kings and then there's five that have fallen, one is and the other is not yet come. And he continues for a short space. In, in my book, I build a case that the, uh, that the point of reference is 1798 when the beast is wounded and now it's in a wounded state. And at that point, five are fallen, one is and the other's not yet come. The five are fallen being uh, the, the kingdoms of Babylon, Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and papal Rome during the Dark Ages. And the one that is, when papal Rome was going down in Revelation 13.10, the next beast that was coming up was, was the United States. The beast with lamb-like horns that comes out of the earth. Uh, and I build a whole case for that. And I see that as the sixth king, and then the seventh king is when, it de when America degenerates into a dragon stage where it speaks like a dragon, enforces the mark, sets up an image of the beast, becomes a false prophet, and this will happen during the short space. Now, that's the view that I present in the book. Uh, I've recently been pondering the idea that, uh, you know, possibly the five that are fallen are Babylon, Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome. The one that is, is papal Rome in a wounded state. And the one that is coming for a short space is papal Rome revived. You know, that's, a, that's another possibility. Uh, the players don't change. You know, my understanding of Revelation 13 and uh, the role of the papacy and the United States and what's coming in America, that doesn't change. Whether you... In, interpret the sixth head as America and the seventh as America in its freedom denying stage or whether you see the sixth head as the papacy wounded and the seventh wound as the papacy coming back it's just a matter of sort of how, how do you view these last uh, two kings but it doesn't change the major players the major players are the Vatican wounded coming back America rising up becoming like the Vatican, enforcing the mark, speaking like a dragon, we lose our freedom. That's what Revelation 13 clearly teaches. And so, uh, you know, I'm wrestling with these things myself, but I'm very clear. And so something else you might find interesting. It's, it's, to me, it's very interesting that in Revelation 13, the lamb-like beast eventually speaks like a dragon. And the, the dragon, I see that lamb-like beast as America eventually degenerating and speaking like a dragon. Now, the dragon, first of all, was pagan Rome, paganism. And then that dragon shifted to giving its power to papal Rome. And I just recently have been thinking that America is speaking like a dragon now with the rise of the pagan and godlessness and the left that we see you know, growing so rapidly in this country. And then as the, as the dragon, the pagan forms, you know, that are speaking, like just, I don't know if you heard just a couple days ago, forgot the man's name, and Naylor, one of the main Democratic leaders, said there's no, they were discussing the Equality Act, and he said there's no place for the will of God in this discussion. And, and, and that just perfectly reflects the, uh, the, 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 the godlessness that is on the rise in this country. So speaking like a dragon uh, is the, the godlessness of what's being taught now, and that's gonna shift to a solution being, being the Pope and the papal power, uh, and eventually enforcing the mark. So 
There's a lot to that text where the lamb-like beast eventually speaks like a dragon, and we, you know, we're going to feel, we're feeling it now, and we're going to feel it more in the days ahead, the voice of the dragon. But the good news is that the lamb will conquer the dragon because he's Lord of lords and king of kings. <laughs> Amen, Hallelujah. Pastor. I, I love everything that you just said. I, I, and honestly, it's funny because you, you didn't make statements. You're, you're saying, well, it, it could be a multiple application in the seven heads. There could be uh, the sixth and seventh head. We could be going back and forth between America. and the, I, I love either application. I, I love exactly what you said across the board, and, the, and it fits uh, whether or not you can consider, uh, you know, in, in the breakdown of the, of the 14 tribes, do you consider the, uh, the two sons of Joseph as one tribe? Do you consider Joseph and his two sons all, all together as separate tribes? Whether or not America is um, on behalf of the Vatican, acting as the Vatican, um, it's, all, it's still all accurate. And although America is disgustingly, shamefully going hard left into paganism, yet the leadership uh, overtly genuflects back towards Rome. As you pointed out in, 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 one, of your, in one of your teachings, you got Kamala Harris quoting Laudato, Laudato C in relation to this outrageous uh, uh, climate change agenda to enslave us with. And you've got, of course, you've got Joe Biden. Uh, how many times has he already visited uh, uh, Rome and the Vatican, genuflecting for the Pope? So we have the same thing going on. America going hard left towards uh, open denial of God, and, and yet at the same time genuflecting before the Vatican in so-called uh, a religious connection. So I would that's say— right. And that's what, we, that's what we see in, in the dragon in chapter 12 merges into the dragon underlying the beast in chapter 13— and that's what I see happening in America. You know, Pastor, and, and what is making this possible is the, uh, the coronavirus and the tyranny the governments are taking. Um, in, in no way, shape, or form do they match this danger that they said exists. For me personally, Pastor, at the very least, I would consider everything involved with the tyranny at least to be types of taking the mark. I consider it as a Christian a matter of conscience how much I am coerced into wearing a mask, being tested, and or taking a vaccine. I would say each Christian would have to consider this in their own conscience. But I'm very uncomfortable with this in relation to the subject matter that we're talking about. Whether or not it relates, I'm not quite sure. But I, I personally am I'm bothered by how much this could fit. I'm not saying that anything related to coronavirus tyranny is the mark per se, but it, I'm, I'm drawing lessons from it. I'm certainly seeing types involved here. And the more I see, the more I, we talk about this tyranny of, of this lamb, the, the, the lamb-like beast of America, pretending to be Christian, turning into the full-on dragon of pagan Rome, uh, I think that, that, that uh, viral tyranny could be a, a mechanism of it. It could, could, could be a yeah. vehicle. Yeah, you know. Yeah, Johnny, it's interesting. I just wrote a track about a week ago called Mask Mandates and the Mark of the Beast. And I sent it to Remnant Publications. They just wrote me back uh, this morning that they're seriously looking at this track, and I hope that they'll publish it and we'll have it available uh, from White Horse Media. And what it does is it looks at the parallels between the pandemic a crisis and the mark of the beast crisis. Now, I, just for the record, I do believe that there is a real, uh, a real coronavirus. I know some people don't even think it's, it's real at all. I think that the reactions, the, the restrictions are over, overblown compared to you know, the, the numbers that are out there closing down the world, closing down the economy, closing down churches. Uh, I think we're also in a religious liberty crisis. But I do believe that the, the coronavirus is real. I do know people that have died of it. I know uh, not in my area, but I know other people. I, I know a physician friend of mine in Kansas who works with long-term care, and he's seen many people that have died of the coronavirus. So yeah, it's, so we're, it's we're being lied to. Let me, let me just say, we're, yeah. we're, we're being lied to by the experts. We're being lied to. So it's entirely possible that there is something that's going on, and it's being manipulated in a way to fool us and to manipulate us. So yeah, it, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very people are dying. Sure, 
Yeah, it, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated situation, but what we do know, this is what we do know, is that we are in, quote unquote, a public health emergency. And in this public health emergency, there has been a, uh, there have been restrictions, and these restrictions uh, in, in many cases are a, uh, a, you know, a threat to, to our basic constitutional rights. And, and we know that there's a parallel between that and what's coming. What's coming is going to be another big, quote, emergency or an emergency, and there will be a re reaction in the name of protecting its citizens, the citizens of the world, from this crisis. And the solution in the coming crisis will be uh, the mark of the beast. And it'll be mandated, uh, and that nobody can buy or sell it unless you go along with the mark. It'll be pre presented as for the common good, and it's for everybody's best interest to go along with this. But we do know that when that crisis hits, there will be a, a, a huge deception uh, underneath the surface. And I see what's happening right now as sort of a dry run, you know, to what's coming in the future. And so I we're, agree, we're right on. I, I agree. Yep. And, and I, would, I would recommend to Christians, based upon their conscience, obviously families, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, they, they do have to provide for their children. And yet, um, I, I think that they could be being, this could be, a, at the bare minimum, there's a type of the mark. There is a, I agree with you, it, it could be a dry run. And I would commend to Christians, individually, based upon their conscience, to resist to the best of their ability, trusting in Christ that he will provide for them. I'm not recommending that, that uh, people refuse to be tested or, or vaccinated and lose their job, but I am recommending that they take it before Christ and ask what the right thing to do is. I will tell you, Pastor, I, I really am very worried about the consequences of, of taking the vaccine. So I think that this is a good, this is a good test for Christians to be close yeah, to and Christ. I, yeah, and I, I know physicians on both sides of the vaccination issue, and maybe we talked about this in the first program that you know, I'm not a physician, and so I have chosen not to, you know, make uh, pontifical pronouncements about whether yay or nay on that topic, because that's not my field. So I'm leaving that to, to other people. I do have to make my own decisions. If, you know, vaccination comes to me where they say you can't get on a plane or you can't do this or do that unless you're vaccinated, then that's a decision that I'm going to have to make myself, but I'm not going to come out and tell everybody what I think they should do. Uh, when it comes to the Bible, I am going to come out and tell everybody what they need to do, and that is they need to follow Jesus Christ, follow the Lamb, keep the Ten Commandments, trust in the blood of the Savior, and study prophecy and get ready to stand up for God in the final crisis. That's very clear. That's my field. Uh, and Paul told me, you know, preach the Word. So that's what I'm doing. Pastor, praise God. I am so excited that you are being... Uh, asked to go on mainstream programs to speak to evangelical audiences, conservative audiences, political audiences, uh, because let me tell you something, everything that, that we've done today I think is absolutely dynamite. I'm so excited. This is one of the best interviews we ever had. Uh, please stay open to us coming back together again just because I had such a good time. Uh, if you would, let me, uh, let me ask you to, to, to close us in prayer. Sure. Yeah, let's, let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for this time that uh, Johnny and I can share, and we do pray that you will use this interview, this time that we've spent, use your word to reach many, many people. Please uh, guide us. Lord, help us to be centered in Jesus Christ. Help us to have the character of Christ. Help us to reflect that character in the way we relate to others. Help us to be firm for truth without compromise, and yet to have humble hearts and to speak the truth in love. Please bless us and guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor, I'm going to make sure that you have all my information. Please, if there's anything I can do, and let me tell my audience, listen, I don't, uh, I don't do uh, donations lightly. Uh, I was excited to send Pastor Steve $100 to help him uh, give out his fantastic new book, Woman of Blood, to anyone that, that uh, is willing to receive it because it absolutely is a spot-on message. So, Pastor, please... Um, uh, don't have